Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Specifying Practice Group call. Um, with that, then, I want to hand it over to Lewis Medcalf for uh, today's session. So, Lewis, over to you to get started on today's call. Hi. <clears throat> I'm speaking to you from sunny downtown Nashville, and it's my privilege and honor to uh, introduce the brains of the outfit, the man who is never ambivalent about ambiguities, who is... Uh, talking to us, will be talking to us today during the lunch hour at uh, World of Concrete in Las Vegas because he would rather talk than eat. David Stutzman! <laughs> what an introduction. Thanks, Lewis. Yeah, and I am. I'm sitting here outdoors on the bleachers overlooking uh, the uh, contest for spec mix for building concrete masonry walls. And actually, uh, was invited to speak at uh, World of Concrete this year by Tau Group, a group who's trying to do some educational uh, programs on developing polished concrete slabs, slabs that actually are flat, and slabs that actually can be maintained. So it's been a great experience so far. There, there are reportedly 110,000 people here for this conference. <laughs> oh my goodness! So it's uh, it's pretty much a mob scene, actually. <laughs> that's that's crazy. So, Lewis, well, how did you come up with this idea for the program today? <laughs> I paid close attention when you told me what you wanted to do. Uh, okay. Yeah. I so what? I think what, what prompted me to uh, suggest this even was that I've been getting some questions of late from several uh, architects uh, because they're working with other consultants that are actually providing specifications on their projects. We had a chance to review some of them and we're discovering all kinds of things uh, that are actually bidding requirements in technical specifications and that's uh, my my prompt, I guess, to go with this program, because I think it's uh, it's important to understand where things do go. And just yesterday, I was talking with a uh, project team in uh, one in our one of our Florida offices that was dealing with some owner documents that had uh, specification type information, especially Division One kind of stuff, in the bidding requirements. Just where you would expect to find it, right? <laughs> so high and dry, where it will, since it's not a contract document, it may not be overly enforceable. I don't know where I got this quote. Information is the currency of the 21st century, but uh, that is kind of a a, a concept that this is uh, uh, the whole issue of information, how to create it, how to manage it, how to disseminate it, and how to retrieve it is really critical. And the retrieval part is one of the most important things. Because if we can agree about where we put the information in up front it'll, with our, our users, the contractor, preparing user-friendly documents, we hope, that they will be able to readily retrieve that information rather than uh, immediately sending off an RFI. Well, and that's what CSI is all about, isn't it? Establish all of the formats so that everybody knows where the information is located so it can be retrieved quickly. Because if you don't, if you can't find it, you ain't got it. So, let's see. Oh, sorry. So you're driving today, right? Yeah, more or less. Okay. There we go. Okay. Yes, you're going to there it is. All right. So um, a, a, I, last year, I actually read a book on information science called In the Beginning Was Information, written by a German professor of information science. But long before that, um, Tommy Smith and I had worked on a, a uh, collaborative uh, effort on a kind of a diagram, and we took this first sentence and, and took it 
strung it out all the way down to compliance. But to begin with, as a simple concept, we have data that are just things that are floating out there, facts, parameters, whatever. Uh, param by parameters, we may mean uh, this decisions by the owner, do they want red brick, you know, do they uh, want a certain kind of roofing. <clears throat> and then structure is how to arrange those data to create information. And so that's to be able to, the, the whole point of uh, everything that a lot that, that CSI has done and specifically what we're going to talk about today, the uniform location of subject matter has to do with having this consistent structure so that everybody is talking the same language. Yeah, because without the structure, it'd be like getting data coming at you through a single stream. And how do you parse the data to even understand what the data content is? Exactly. So, so one of the great inventions of the late 20th century is the idea of a database where you have information floating around, data I should say, floating around and you sort that in different ways to create information or extract information from the raw data. And this is an example of how <clears throat> these bits of information about different concrete uses, very appropriate for uh, David's uh, endeavors this week, can be sorted out. On the one hand, we sort it in, uh, if we're writing a preliminary project description or other elemental description, we sort it according to the vertical line. But on the other hand, if we're writing construction specifications, we sort it by master format on the horizontal line. So it's a structured query or question for a specific purpose. What do we want this data to do? What kind of information is needed? Right, and that and that structure is really just, I would say, almost incidental data. And again, if you go back to that single data stream, it's what else do I have to send along that stream so that you can actually understand where the breakpoints in the data are to make it useful. And that's what the structures are doing. Now one of the really important and foundational documents in uh, the construction industry is the Uniform Location of Subject Matter, USLM, which you can get for free at uh, this is one website. You can also download it from AIA. It is published jointly by EJCDC, the Engineers Joint Contract Documents Committee, AIA, and CSI. And it does not get down too far into the weeds. It does not duplicate master format or uniformat. But what it does is talk about the general topics and where within the, the construction documents, the contract documents, those subjects should be addressed. And Lois, I see that I was dyslexic typing this in, wasn't I? ULSM, Uniform <laughs> Location of Subject Matter. I, I caught the... I don't know I, what it was then. I caught the... Yeah, it's I don't know what... The apostrophe, I fixed that, but I missed the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the ULSM, yes. Well, we have to that's fix that what before happens. we post it. Yeah, that's yeah, that's what happens when you're doing this late at night, I guess. Uh, <laughs> so Matt, here's a let's let's so let's let's ask our audience today, who's who is even familiar with uh, uniform location subject matter? If they could just raise their hands, and Lois, you might have to help me on this to see what kind of response is. This was a document that CSI had actually uh, published before, it was a, a co-author before, and it had fallen into uh, obscurity, I think, and was actually no longer available in, in print. But it was, in the last several years, uh, brought back to life again. I know we had Joel Altlin uh, representing CSI that participated in the committee that brought this thing back. 
and as you can yep. see, you, uh, Lewis mentioned that it is published jointly, and it, uh, and that's that's a good sign that everybody here involved in the document is taking uh, the, the responsibility to make sure that it's all coordinated with their documents. So okay. EJCDC and AIA are not identical, especially in Division Zero documents, but the uniform location of subject matter addresses both. Uh, and we had a couple of so questions. What was, what was the result? Um, uh, there's, okay, only a hand, there's only a handful of people who are familiar with the, with the document. Um, Oh, good. Then I'm glad we're talking about it. So, yeah, it's, it's a good thing that we're addressing it because it's really a very handy document, and it's free. Um, we had a couple of questions that are addressed about master format questions, and um, if you want to address those separately to uh, David and I by email, uh, we'll try to assist you with that. But right now we're going to be talking about this particular document and how it works. Okay, are you ready for the next slide, David? Sure, go ahead. Okay, here's what one of the pages looks like. Yeah, go into the next one because we'll zoom in and, and show it a little bit better. Okay, let me close right. the... Okay, so this is just the very first page out of Uniform Location Subject Matter, and you can see... Uh, which is not somebody is enamored only about with 10. 20 pages. Yeah, but somebody's enamored with the number 10. We had to get 10 items going across the top <laughs> of the, the page. So all of the subject matter, it's arranged alphabetically, and it's, it's really uh, by keyword, if you would. And they've tried to indicate whether where the location of that subject is actually recommended to be dealt with. And, it's, now, and it gives you several options, a primary and a secondary, indicated by the P and the S. Yeah, go ahead, Lewis. Um, we might, before we get further along, uh, observe that this is really talking limited to the written documents, the verbal documents, as opposed to the graphic documents. It does not address what goes where in the drawings, and that's a whole other question that we could address sometime. There's but no standard David, for that. that <laughs> but, as David, but as David has said, but it's a critical issue, but as David has said, the, uh, the P stands for the primary, the S for the secondary statement, and the X is where there would be a cross-reference to indicate where the primary statement is and you can see that in under the notes that uh, there's a differentiation there between the AIA and the EJCDC documents but the kind of the rationale behind this and you can see it does not go down into breaking into divisions or anything it's the general strategic level kinds of information and where they should be handled so, for example, alternates or alternatives, the preferred uh, uh, CSC terminology, and where they would be listed, the primary listing would be the general requirements division one, rather than in the product specifications two through 49. Right, and if, if we follow this uniform location subject matter, it really simplifies finding the information for everybody because it get, brings that standardization that CSI is seeking so that the information is easily retrievable and that really is the key. Which means that we should be paying attention to it as we are uh, creating that information and, and putting it into our documents. Now, most of <laughs> Oh, they ca the cops after you, David. Oh, uh, sorry, no, just an ambulance going by. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as they bypassed you. Anyway, um, that as long as the um, 
CSI documents, master format, unit format, and page format, section format, all of those are fairly well integrated with this. But if you, where this can come in, especially good handy is if you're having some discussions with an owner who may not <clears throat> be familiar with uh, the general way that construction documents are handled in the US, uh, whether it's a foreign client or even a, a client that's never built a building before, this is a really handy way to explain why we want to put bidding requirements separate from general conditions, separate from product specifications. Right, and actually uh, on a recent project I was working on a new shopping mall in Trinidad uh, this became a big help because we were we were using uh, the FIDIC, the international, and uh, geared more towards engineering their standard documents. So this became almost for me a checklist uh, while I was re reviewing the FIDIC general conditions. You know what did I find that were that AIA or the Uniform Location Subject Matter chose to indicate was a different location so now I could cross-reference and it actually worked very well to try to help organize the documents. Okay, so Lewis, you want to move on to the next one. I just want to talk about the headings uh, that, the, that the uniform location is trying to use and it breaks it out as CSI's master format does by procurement requirements and, co and contract documents. So the procurement documents, if you can think of Division Zero, uh, and it's really anything before 005000. It's not a hard time saying these six digit numbers. So 005000, because 5000 is what starts the uh, contracts. Everything before that becomes only the procurement documents. So the break point right after the bid, the proposal, or the tender document that the contractor would submit to the owner for consideration. The second half of Division Zero, go ahead, Lewis. Is the contract document, so it begins with the agreement. The agreements start at 005000 the general conditions, the supplementary conditions, and finally, the most important part, of course, the specifications. Right? We're not talking about drawings here, right? Only written documents. So, of course, the specs will be most important. So, Lewis, are you seeing the fo folks that are actually writing specifications, some of the documents that you see reviewing, they follow this explicitly, correct? <laughs> Well, of course, our spec masters in our multi-office, multi-discipline firm are set up appropriately. The problem comes in when we have clients who have their own front-end front end documents. Now, I know front-end is kind of a nebulous uh, uh, phrase and sometimes can even include Division One, but we get things from owners who have a staff attorney that says, well, I'm going to write general conditions, I'm going to write bidding requirements, and I'm going to tell them in the bidding requirements that they've got to have uh, dust partitions for this project to keep uh, the rest of the building free from uh, disturbance for, with new construction and so forth. And just don't understand that the general organization that is usual and customary in the uh, in construction, and so that's where we're running into some issues. Uh, we have uh, we're building a couple of uh, tire factories, <coughs> tire manufacturing factories for uh, two foreign firms, and we run into some misunderstandings uh, quite a bit because. Um, Surprise, surprise, not everyone follows the North American model for contracting uh, for construction. 
Right. Well, and what we see with the owner's documents, if it's a custom owner contract in general conditions, often the bidding requirements and the, con the contract uh, requirements, the agreement, the conditions are all rolled into a single document. And that, that can, depending upon how you structure the agreement, cause some complications. If you, if you have the bidding requirements contained in the same document that includes the agreement and the things that you'll carry forward as contract documents. I've, over the years, I've also observed a number of uh, public uh, agencies, governmental groups, that tend to have multiple documents that are not well coordinated within themselves. Uh, that are all the stuff in front of the general conditions. And sometimes they will have both supplementary conditions and what they'll call special conditions. Um, but um, all of those things are very, can be very confusing. And of course, one of the things that we have to deal with if you have owner written general conditions that are not standard form AIA. EJCTC, Consensus Docs, Design Build Institute Docs, whatever, is that uh, it takes a lot of work to go through those and figure out what things we would normally cover in Division One are already covered in general conditions and some of the things that we would expect to be in the general conditions that are missing that we may need to cover in Division One. So the coordination with owner written general conditions can be very difficult and it's because they don't follow this wonderful document the uniform location of subject matter. And just just to enlighten everybody in case they should happen to know Sharice uh, Lakeside, she's here with me at uh, World of Concrete. And this morning she was able to convince, I'm looking in the right direction here. She was able to convince the John Deere equipment folks to allow her to try the timed trial with the front end loader. So I've got to find out how she did. Okay. <laughs> definitely, just, definitely. Just to complete a side, you know, they have to drive the front end loader through a bunch of cones, not knocking the cones over. They have to pick up a barrel with a strap hung from the bucket of the front end loader, and then they have to dump a ball from John the bucket Wal into, a, into a barrel. John Warclay yeah. requests so that you post photos of that. <laughs> <laughs> she now, might uh, already have gone, been done now that I'm sitting here and thinking about it. And Corey Morris also asks, she says, Therese is my chapter president. We really need those photos. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Thomas uh, Clevenger asked the question, is there a ULSM type document currently available or in the process of being developed for consensus docs? And the answer to that is no, but it's really not needed. The, the, this is the concept that the consensus docs should be conforming to the uniform location of subject matter. Uh, it's not a controversial document. It really does represent the, uh, the consensus of the uh, design and construction community throughout the North America, both in the U.S. and UL Canada. Yeah, ULSM is more a strategic kind of a yes. document. It's at a very high level so that the concept of where things belong in Division Zero would remain the same regardless what the contract was based upon. So I, I think that it would apply still certainly to the consensus docs. Uh, whether or not consensus docs follows this explicitly or not is another question. Uh, they weren't party to ULSM in putting this together. So I uh, can't say, I, I can't recall that we've actually done a project using consensus docs yet. Although I do understand it's used quite a bit in uh, design build work. Uh, for those of you who are interested, there's one of our 
old programs a couple of years ago, we had a uh, an architect who was also a licensed attorney uh, assisting us, and we went through the consensus doc. So you might want to look that up in our archive. But the the, the point is, what we're t telling people is merely, for example, that certain information should be in Division One. It doesn't say what section it's in. Same thing, the, if we, a certain subject matter should be covered in the general conditions, uh, it doesn't say whether it's in Article 3, or Article 12, or wherever. It just says that that's where, at a strategic level, it should be, that it belongs in the, the certain kinds of information are more appropriate as general conditions, the business relationship between the owner and the contractor as opposed to Division One, the administrative and procedural requirements to carry out those business relationships. Okay, you want to move on? Requirements, this is what I was trying to explain, is the front half of Division Zero, everything up through 004999, and I don't know if anybody's actually using those numbers, but these are generally the kinds of things that it requires. The advertisement, the invitation, depending upon uh, the, how you're actually putting a project out uh, for contractor consideration. It could even be a request for a proposal. The instructions, whether it's to bidders or to a proposer, uh, would be the, the same virtually but still it's the instructions about how to present the bid or the proposal, all of the bid forms, and all of the bid attachments. Everything that the design team requires the contractor to submit to make sure that they understand what is being requested and be able to make sure that the design team and the owner can actually evaluate uh, one bid or one proposal against all of the others. Right. So you want to go to the next one, Lewis? Sure. And the, then the contracting requirements are the second half of Division Zero, going from 5,000, 5, I still want to say 500, uh, up, th up to and butting up against Division One. So it's the contract. And it doesn't matter what form a contract, it's any any of the contract forms. It's the general conditions and supplementary conditions. I didn't include here the last item that falls in Division Zero. That would be addenda or modifications. Specifications, we know Division One is part of the specification group under master format, so it's all of Division One, the general requirements plus all of the other subgroups of the specifications group going from Division 2 all the way through 49. So it's every everything that would be considered the technical specifications plus Division 1. And finally, the drawings. So how do these pieces fit together, Lewis? <laughs> i go to the next. Push the button, Lewis. All right. Okay, you can push it again. Let's look at the whole group. Ah, you had some fly-ins. Yeah, so what's that divide? Wait, slow down. <laughs> okay. Now you're just rushing through here. Okay. Sorry so about there's that. a gigantic divide between procurement and contracting. That's the line at which point you actually sign the agreement. So on the left, before you get to signing the agreement, at least under AIA, you'll have addenda. And on the right, you'll have what, Lewis? You'll have change orders, architect supplemental instructions, and perhaps other forms of modifications. Like bulletins? Like whatever those are, yes. <laughs> No, you're not allowed. No, you're no. You're supposed to help me here. You don't do bulletins, right? It, it depends. That's not Some even a defined term. 
<laughs> no, it's not. And uh, I have owners that insist on using that terminology, and so we are very careful to define that term in our Division One specifications. But they absolutely insist on using that terminology, uh, usually for um, work packages for fast track construction. Yeah, so the, but the overall term that covers all of those changes once you sign the agreement is, is modifications. Contract so modifications. It could be, right. So it could be change orders. It could be architectural supplemental instructions. Uh, it could be change directives. And those are all well-defined terms in, in the AIA agreements. Uh, now, and that's we, why we wanted to talk about this divide at that agreement. Now, we Say. probably should observe, though, that some uh, government agencies, bless their hearts, will in fact uh, state that the procurement requirements, the bidding, are become contract documents when they are listed in the owner-architect agreement or the owner-contractor agreement that should list all the uh, contract documents and it will list them. Now I've, I've done lots of projects for those government agencies. I've never actually experienced where somebody in, enforced something that was in the bidding requirements that was not in the uh, typical contract documents, but um, that is something that uh, you know our audience should know about, that that does happen. and. If the owner tells you to do it, then it's the owner's lookout. Well, and these are the legal documents that the owner are really responsible for anyhow. But if if we were to follow the best recommended practice, if there is a bidding requirement that is intended to become a contract document, it should be repeated in the contract documents. Yes, absolutely. And, and that is probably the only time that you'll hear me say, repeat information in a specification. Yes, yes the, the man who is never ambivalent about ambiguities. But of course, <laughs> well, and, and one we, of the we try to avoid that stuff. <laughs> and one of the, the primary reasons for that is it'll be lost. So if you put some important thing that the owner really wants to have happen on the job, hide it in the procurement requirements, who's going to find it there? Contractors probably not going to look at it because once the contract's signed, I guarantee you, even if the even if the contract for a government agency says that the procurement requirements are contract documents, I can I'll bet anything that no contractor will ever read them again. And so if you put something in there that you really, the owner, uh, really wants to have happen, it may not occur because it gets lost. So, because people are used to looking for information in the right places rather than looking for information in all the wrong places. Is that a song? Right. Can I write a song about that? Looking for information in all the wrong places. Maybe it'd make a good blue grass song. Yeah, <laughs> perhaps. Okay, so once we cut this cord with the bidding documents, what happens, Lois? Go to the next one, I think. Aha. Discard. Yeah, and, yeah, and this is why I'm saying that if there is something important in the bidding requirements, and, and think about this because the bid form or the bid attachments, if you have alternates for a particular project, you're going to collect all the pricing as part of the bid submission. It'll either be on the bid form itself or it'll be an attachment to the bid form. But because it's a bidding document, if you don't transfer for all of that information to the contract, you've lost it. Because essentially, because of how the contracts are structured, you would take that and essentially throw it away. What we try to do is make the 
those kinds of documents, attachments to the bid form rather than part of the bid form. And at least that way, if, if you do need them to formalize the contract, you can reference them as a contract document rather than recreating those same forms uh, within the contract. And that helps it is just simplify producing the contract. But as uh, John Workley uh, uh, stated earlier uh, in one of his comments, that uh, th these owner documents can be such a mess and you don't dare try to change them. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to persuade owners to act in their own best interests. I've been in on a number of those conversations myself, so you're quite right. I agree with you completely, John. Okay, so what what happens then if we have bidding requirements actually included in specifications? We signed well, the contract, and now we have bidding requirements. I and one of the most common places I see this is if there's a an envelope consultant involved. For instance, the curtain wall section that they may write is going to have bid submissions written yes. into the technical documents. It'll have required drawings, calculations perhaps, and bid samples, even mock-ups, all written into the technical section. So you get to the, enforcing the contract and now you have bidding requirements strewn through the section what is enforceable and what is not so what let's go to the next one the next fade in what what I when I see these kinds of things occurring in the technical sections I'm always encouraging the author whoever it may be to move those requirements into the bidding documents. That's where they're going to be most easily found, especially if it's in the instructions. If you, if you lay out a whole section, it's called instructions to bidders, as to what you expect them to provide to be able to furnish you a complete bid, that's where to list these requirements. And there's all a very good checklist for the bidder. Do I have it? Do I did I submit the calculations? Did I submit the curtain wall drawings? And it's a great checklist for the design team to make sure that they got everything. And of course, if it's to go in back the technical our, documents, you don't have that same advantage. And you may over, and the bidders may in fact overlook it. Especially if it looks like it's kind of boilerplate, because they're going to be focused more on part two in terms of pricing out. So, and likewise, I guess Lewis, you were saying earlier. Yeah, you were saying earlier you were finding contract documents in the bidding requirements. So why don't you push the button again? Okay. And <laughs> Lewis. Gotcha. Yes. Oh, I thought I had lost the connection. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead to the next uh, advance. So wh where does this craziness come from? Make sure that we're looking at this stuff carefully so that we're not intermixing. And, of course, this is the follow-up to uh, uh, keep s certain things forever, and, and David is saying at least the specs, because we all know specs are more important than drawings, right? I know they are. I don't know about anyone else. <laughs> well, judges and juries tend to believe that. Well, you know what, Lewis? What? We've come to the end, and we finished oh, early. You, you had another one. I thought you had another slide. Oh, okay. Well, we were talking about, let's talk about one of the reasons for this um, business happening is that um, <clears throat> where we run into problems is when there's a consultant who is used to writing standalone contracts. 
examples would be uh, food surface equipment. I've had guys who uh, food service equipment consultants who uh, write things in there. They'll put the bidding requirements in in their specification. Uh, they'll even electrical requirements that they're technically not really allowed to, to put in their documents. Uh, they will contradict uh, Division One. They'll contradict the uh, general conditions, all because they have their blinders on that they are used to writing uh, sections that are only uh, that are for a single contract. Well, yeah, uh, let's talk about that because there are a number of those consultants that may very well have, in many cases, a direct contract with the owner. And so they're used to including all of what might be Division One and what might be bidding requirements in a single set of documents. But when they're working as part of a design team and now they have to assemble their uh, particular spec section or multiple sections into a project manual, now it tends to create some confusion unless those requirements are extracted from their technical sections and relocated if necessary. I, so how many times, Lewis, do you get those specialty consultants to revise their documents to actually coordinate? Um, I'm always successful. But now whether whether I can get them to change it reasonably or if I just go in and fix it. Since they're not s stamping or sealing their documents, I feel free to go in and make the changes that I think are appropriate. Uh, we might give our, some of our folks some other examples. Uh, you mentioned um, a, uh, a, a building envelope consultant who might write the curtain wall spec. Um, I mentioned the food service. Um, I've had this issue with elevator consultants. Um, what are a couple of others that people might want to be on the lookout for some craziness in? David, did I lose you? And, and, and in some respects, uh, bless their hearts, the mechanical and electrical and plumbing engineers as well, because oftentimes they're working direct for an owner. They, there may not be an architectural component to the project, so we find Despite their uh, mechanical general section yeah. often contains much of the duplication of Division One, which is not overly legal if you read IBC, the Chapter One of IBC. But that's another that's a subject for another discussion. That's another story. Because okay. they're supposed to, the IBC, just for our audience, our, the IBC requires that there be a single design prof professional and responsible charge of the project who is charged with coordinating and being in uh, charge of the production of all the documents to build the building. And so the question is, if the owner is supplying, uh, has a separate uh, MPE uh, engineer, is that person, that person is not under the authority of the architect, and so is the architect really meeting that requirement to be the design professional and responsible charge of the project? I'm sorry, I don't recall the exact. Uh, citation in there, but it's in chapter one if you want to look it up. Um, Wayne uh, Smith asked the question, please talk about where to specify materials uh, for patching. Uh, for instance, patcher, plaster patching and terrazzo patching. Should all this go in uh, 09, 0160 or 70, or do they belong in 09, 0500. Uh, does it make more sense to put them with a specific subdivision such as uh, uh, Plaster 2001 and Terrazzo 096601? Um, you, you want to take that one, David? 
it depends. Uh, I, I don't say that uh, lightly, but it, to me, I, when I'm writing these kinds of things where it's patching, it really depends upon the extent of the patching. If it's a minor item, I will probably write the patching as part of uh, the specification that would be the overall. So if it's terrazzo patching and I have new terrazzo to go with it, and the patching is relatively minor, I would probably put it right with the terrazzo section. If it's patching that is mostly patching and very little new or not, nothing that is new, then I would consider pulling it out and putting it into the maintenance area of Division 9 at the beginning of Division 9 uh, for the repair of all of the terrazzo. So to me, I, I look at the, it somewhat as a question of scope and relative scope, patching to new. How, okay. how are you approaching those kinds of subjects, Lewis? I'm, I'm the same general uh, approach that you have outlined. Oh, we had another comment um, I want to pick up. Uh, you were talking about uh, the documents to keep forever, and Mary Noe points out that structural engineers uh, believe that drawings are forever, but specifications tend to evaporate, and so they put their design assumptions and a lot of the uh, design criteria and a lot of other critical information on drawing and uh, drawing notes. Uh, she says, I don't argue anymore. The, the, the problem is, <laughs> well, you know, I'm not a that's purist. Been promulgated. Yeah, the, but don't you think the, that's been promulgated, though, by the building officials? Because they're asking for oh, structural yes. engineers to put all of the material notes on the cover sheet for the structural drawings, presumably as the future record. Because they don't want to read specifications. That, uh, if you tell them that a certain information is in this, the specs, they will say, I want it on the drawings. Um, the problem is the duplication. And the man who is never ambivalent about ambiguities uh, will back me up to say that anytime you duplicate information, you run the risk of creating an ambiguity because they're not going to be exactly the same. And structural engineers run into this all the time, is that they tend to use kind of standard language specifications, and they cover the same area that is sometimes in their general notes, and that there are discrepancies between them. Sometimes they get ironed out in RFIs, sometimes they just get ignored, but uh, it, it is an ongoing uh, situation with them. But uh, as I said, I, I'm not a real purist about this. It doesn't make any difference where you put the specifications. You can put all the specs on the drawings. It's a matter of not creating uh, duplications that in turn lead to ambiguities. So one place or the other, but right. not both. Um, yeah. We have this. And I, I would agree with that. I would agree with you totally on that, Lewis. Put it, put it in one place, and just be consistent. Don't duplicate it. That's where you get yourself in trouble. Yeah, like the where I work now, the, my interior designers like to put all of their actual finished product selections in a schedule on the drawings, and then we just have a spec that covers the submittals and the installation requirements and maybe some of the installation materials that are needed to install the tile or the ceiling uh, panels that are that are actually specified on the drawings. And all of that works, so as I say, it's just uh, avoiding the duplications. All right. Great. Well, we finished a few minutes early. This has got to be a record. And <laughs> we're going to have to now come up with a, a topic for next month. Ah, uh, yes. Well, I was going to call my our friend, uh, my friend Mike Chap, to to see about uh, maybe he will join us for a discussion of uh, lean design activities, and that may get a little outside the specifying uh, area, but I think he's got some ideas that might be of of use to us, and if that doesn't work out, why uh, we'll think of something. 
but we encourage everybody to keep those, uh, all our friends and neighbors, to keep the cards and letters coming in, so that uh, because we really do want this program, this set of webinars, to be your programs and address the issues that that you see uh, that we need. And I hope that um, today has inspired everyone to uh, log on to the CSI or AIA websites and download a copy of the uniform location of subject matter and familiarize yourself with it. It's not onerous. It's not um, it's not going to contradict what you're already doing necessarily, but it may help you in your discussions with your project teams and with clients to help them understand why we locate things uh, where they are. And we're going to go back. We've had a request. Let's see. Let me escape here. We're going to go back to where that um, – where is – ah, here it is. So there's where you can get it, wcsinet.org, homepage category, formats, USLM, PDF. Yeah, you can just log on to your uh, CSI website and use the search box, and it'll take you right to the page to download. All right. And uh, we had a, a Lewis, I'm having a little bit of trouble with the audio okay. on my end, so I think I'm about get ready to sign off. Okay, and, well, I'm, uh, I'll let I you have, close out the program. Well, I had one more comment from Kevin Hopkins who said that I think engineering design information and interior materials go into graphic documents. Uh, for the owner's future reference, and, that, and that's very true. That's very true. So, thank everyone for uh, showing and uh, for your attendance, and we look forward to talking to you next month. Matt. All right. Well, yep. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Dave and Lewis. Again, Dave, enjoy the rest of your time at World of Concrete. We hope you don't get lost in the crowd. And Lewis, enjoy that new office with a view. And we will see you guys all back here in March uh, for a topic to be determined. Thanks again, everybody. And you may now disconnect and go back to your day.